So here I am. Uh, Dad uh, was stubborn. He wanted. Uh, we originally I was going to preach both Sunday morning and Sunday night, but he said uh, I'm going to preach Sunday morning. So it is what it is. He's stubborn. <clears throat> there was a story um, about a minister and a young child. I had read a long time ago, um, and bring it out for lessons like this because it's a really good story. Um, so the story goes, you know, it's all about a pack of Smarties. You know, the, the, the little roll, roll of chalky candy that I don't really understand why we like so much is really kind of chalky. It really doesn't uh, bring out the essence of what a candy or a chocolate bar would be in my taste. So it has about 15 pieces in it. So, you know, it's perfect for sharing or giving to other people because I mean, it's just a little bitty round uh, th- you know, a piece of candy that's easy to be given away. Uh, The minister of this congregation at the time, it's a small congregation, probably about 100. Um, There's this young family that has a child. Um, He's three years old, uh, about to turn four, uh, but in his Bible class on Sunday morning, he gets a pack of Smarties, as if he does his homework. So he always does his homework, so he always gets his pack of Smarties. Well, he, you know, comes in that Sunday morning after Bible class, and uh, the minister comes up to him and says, hi, it's a small congregation. Everybody knows everybody type deal. And so the young boy uh, was eating his pack of Smarties. So he gives one to the, to the minister um, with a very, very happy face, very joyous face, um, and wants to give one. The heart of a young child. Throughout the next two years, him and that young boy enjoyed and shared this moment every Sunday morning after Bible class. And his mom began to start giving him Smarties for doing his chores at home and such. Um, and so he would always accumulate Smarties throughout the week. And, and so every time he got a pack of Smarties from the next two years, the first one he would take out and he would put in his pocket during the week. And on Sunday morning, he was going to give it to the, to the minister of the congregation. So every week he, he had these Smarties in his pocket. And that was the first one from his pack. Regardless of when he got it, he put it in his pocket. Well, you know, young, young boys, he was out in the mud, he was out in this, he was out in that. Every, mor- every night he would take it out, sit on his nightstand out of his, pe- his pants, and the next morning he would get a new pair of pants or new shorts, and he would put it back in them. So he always had his Smarties wherever he was. So he would begin, every Sunday he kept giving it to him, even if it had lint and such on it. Well, what he did was he gave of what he had to the minister. He had a cheerful heart when doing so. And so understanding and learning from stories like these about young, young children that have that giving attitude helps us today to understand what it's like to give, what it's like to be cheerful in our actions. In James chapter 1 and verse 17, it says, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. It's amazing to think about the God that we serve. It's amazing to think about this God that has everything but yet gave us so much. The God that doesn't need anything but gave us so much. So when you take a step back and think of all the things we have, especially in the United States, all the things we have, um, and yet everything is from God. Every good thing was given from God. Our our passage, Matthew chapter 16, it says, verse 25, For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. In the world's sense, that makes, you know, in the world's eyes, that makes no sense. They don't get it. What do you mean? If if I lose my life, I don't have anything. Um, But we as Christians understand what that means. We losing our life to Christ, we will gain everything everything that matters. 
everything that moth and rust won't destroy. We gain everything that matters. Verse 26 says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? When thinking about things that we give in exchange for things, we give money, we give um, our time, we give all these things for exchange for other things. But on the day of judgment, you know, what have we done with our lives? What have we put in front of God? We put things, you know, so many lists and, and such. We have my Wednesday night talks and, you know, we put sports and shopping and new gadgets and new cars and new houses, going out to eat, um, vacation, and just trying to get rich in front of our Lord and Savior. We throw it in his face so often. Tonight I want to look at three, three things in particular that could represent our pack of Smarties. Our pack of Smarties being what we are giving what we are cheerfully giving, what we're cheerfully putting aside for Christ, what we're cheerfully putting aside for others, our pack of Smarties. Just like the young, young boy, and so much we can learn from young children. The first point tonight is to give our time. We all have the same amount. We all have 24 hours a day, or in my sister's case, 25. She, she uh, did a math calculation the other day when we were playing game. Yeah, uh, it was well. We were just talking, and uh, it's 2,200 hours. And Sam was like, "Well, 25, 24, 23, 22. It must be nine o'clock." Because, but she started with 25 hours in the day and subtracted three. <laughs> it, it, I didn't know what to say. I just laughed at her, and she realized finally what what, what was wrong. Um, but we can give our time. And what are we giving our time to? When you when you step back and think about it. When you think about wholeheartedly, at the end of the day, you know, you may have had 16 or 18 hours throughout the day to do something for Christ. And when you lay your head down on that pillow, what did you do? If it's a Monday or a Tuesday, you know, a day we don't meet for services, what did you do for Christ that day? If you can't think of anything, it's a problem. If you haven't picked up your Bible that day, there's a problem. If you haven't thought about a song, a church song, there's a problem. If you haven't been kind to someone that day, there's a problem. We all have so much time. Those of the world have the same amount of time. And they're getting fed everything else from everywhere else more readily than they are getting shared the gospel, the word that Dad talked about this morning. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3 through 5, it says, Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than who? Than ourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourself, which also was in Christ Jesus. Understanding that Christ was the ultimate example. Understanding that he was the ultimate form of unselfish behavior. Everything he did was for others. Everything. You think about that? Everything he did was for others. He prayed for others. He saved others. He taught others. What he did was for other people. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 38 it reads, Give and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure it will be measured to you in return. When thinking about working for Christ, when thinking about working as a Christian, Understanding that if we put Christ first, we will lose our life to Christ and we will be rewarded and we will be, our lives will be taken care of. No longer a concern of where our next meal will come from because we know Christ will take care of us. When you have that understanding and you have that belief in God that where it doesn't matter, I'm giving it all to Christ. And after that, I will be taken care of. When you come to that realization as a Christian, Life will become so much simpler. In 1 John chapter 3, starting at verse 16, it says, We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Let Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. Loving indeed. Our deeds are what we do. The same 24 hours as the world. 
the same amount of time, what we do and what we teach ought to be the truth of the gospel. Our lives ought to overflow with joy so that Christ is seen. Just saying we, we love you isn't enough. If we come in, you know, into services, our love for our brothers and sisters here needs to be seen and felt. There's a big difference between seen love and felt love. You can say a lot of things, but if you're not doing or backing up what you're saying, it's pointless. It's pointless. This can be done through so many measures, and we have a lot of opportunity here at Arnold with everything that happens, but um, just a short list. You've, you've probably heard a list like this before, but I want to say it again. Repetition. Sending cards or letters are a way of encouragement. Making a meal for someone. Inviting someone into your home. Helping someone put up a new front porch. Is that If there is a need, take care of it. Don't wait for somebody else. We show our love by our deeds and by the truth of it. Um, one thing I always think about the church, and, and it can become stagnant for reasons that, are, that shouldn't be, that should not be. We need to have the problem of having too many people jumping at the opportunity to go on a mission trip that we have to go to 10 places a year instead of two or three. We have to go to 10 places a year because we literally just can't have that many people go to those places because they can't house us. We have to go to Nicaragua. We have to, we have to go to 10 places instead of a few. We need to have these kind of problems, not the problems of how are we going to pay the electric bill because we don't have enough people in here. If we're all living our Christian lives, these are the kind of problems we're going to have. We need to have the problem of having too many people wanting to bring dinner to someone when they have surgery or they have um, their families going through a lot. We need to have too many people doing that. We need to have too many people wanting to come to the auditorium that the elders have to decide on what we're going to do, where we're going to move. How are we going to make it bigger? How are we going to get more people in here? How are we going to get more people at the fellowships? That fellowship hall won't hold everyone that attends here, barely. We need to have a reason to build another one or to start a congregation down the road. We need to have a reason to do these things. These are problems we want. We have to buy more buses because the teens are too big, and we need two or three of those buses that we have. We, we need to expand, expand, expand. But without the desire to give our time, it's not going to happen. Not giving our time in, in uh, door knocking, not giving our time to our fellow workers at work. What's more important, to get the job done at work or to show someone Christ? Do them both. Be more efficient with your time. In Romans chapter 12, let's read this passage together. It's a lengthy passage. If you have your Bibles, please turn. Romans chapter 12, verse 4. We'll be starting. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function. It means they don't do the same thing, necessarily. Verse 5. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ, individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy according to the portion of his faith, if service and serving or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. That verse 10, where it says, be devoted to one another, talking about giving our time for the church so that we can have too many mission trips. That's not a problem. It's not too many mission trips. We can have so many problems because we have so many people jumping at the gun to do things. Being devoted to one another, making sure that the brothers and sisters here are taken care of, making sure the shut-ins are taken care of, making sure if someone's out of town, their grass is mowed. All these things are devoted to one another, calling one another after we have surgery. There's so many that do all these things already but there's so much more that can be done, always. Our work is never done as Christians. Verse 11, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, preserving in tribulation, devoted to prayer. At the prison today, um, we just started a series on the five acts of worship. 
and devoted to prayer and, and talking with the men at the, at the prison with prayer, and they have so much time in their hands. But well, we too have time that we can devote to prayer so often. Uh, driving in the car is something that I've um, religiously now, I say religiously, I repetitively now have told myself I need to pray when I'm driving because I drive a lot for my career. Um, and spending more and more time devoted to prayer, and that could be devoted to prayer for one another um, so that we are devoted to one another in the, in the church. Verse 13 says, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. If your home can hold five people, you should be inviting people over for dinner. If you're living and breathing and you have the money to afford a meal, you should invite someone over for it. These are things that we need to have problems. We need to have too many people asking us for dinner and we just, all of our nights are booked. And then we just have to keep going down the road. We need to have these problems. Secondly, the first was giving of our time. Secondly, we need to give of our money. Giving of our money because whose money is it? It's Christ. It's God's. It's not ours. It never has been, never will be. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 through 19, it reads, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. When thinking about the church in other countries, especially India, there are so many brethren that have nothing. I mean, absolutely nothing. And guess what? The church in India takes care of them. The other brothers and sisters take care of them. They're sharing their wealth. If it's, you know, a, a bag of rice, um, they're sharing their wealth. How much more should we be sharing with one another? How much more can we give to one another? How much more can we give to the glory of God? In Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 38, another passage in this Starting in verse 38, it reads, In his teaching he was saying, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like respectful greetings in the marketplaces and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets who devour widows' houses and for appearance's sake offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. We shouldn't do it for show. We shouldn't pray for show. We shouldn't teach for show. We shouldn't do anything for show. Everything should be to the glory of God and thanksgiving to God. We should be willing to give our last penny for the cause of Christ. For his gospel to be reached across the world, we should be willing to give everything for that. Uh, the widow's might, a story that a lot of us have heard sure, but some of us haven't. So let's, let's look at that. It says, And he sat down opposite the treasury and began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury, and many rich people were putting in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which amount to a cent. Calling his disciples to him, he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury. For they all put in, out, put in out of their surplus, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she owned, all she had to live on. The scribes and Pharisees at this time were being, you know, they were rich, they were wearing their long robes, they were gloating about the amount of wealth that they had, they had um, put in the box, it meant nothing to Jesus. It meant nothing that they were just giving out of their surplus, they didn't care, it, it wasn't affecting them. They did it with the wrong intentions, not out of a cheerful heart like a young boy with this pack of Smarties. But merely to be seen by men to up their status or status in the community. The poor widow gave everything. I mean, that, that's all she had. It was not unnoticed by Jesus when he said, he said to them, Truly I say to you, the poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury for they all put in their out of their surplus 
it's not unseen by Jesus. Regardless of who sees it on this earth, the money that we give and, the, and our time, it doesn't matter if men see us. It matters that Christ always sees us. So we're giving of our time, we're giving of our money, we're also giving of our Jesus. We're giving of our Jesus. When you stop and think about that for a second, what does that mean? Essentially, we're giving the gospel. We're giving of our Jesus. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 through 20, starting verse 16, normally just here 18 through 20. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things. And lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. When thinking about being a cheerful giver, and thinking about what could be the best thing you could give to someone. Ultimately, what is that? That's Jesus. That's the love we have for Jesus. That's the devotion we have to Jesus. That's the obedience we have to his word. When you can share that with someone, everything else will be taken care of. That time and that money, it will be taken care of. Giving of our Jesus is, should be our number one priority. If Jesus' number one priority was to seek and save the lost while he was here, and he is the example we are to follow, then what should we be doing? We should be seeking and saving the lost, and that should be our number one priority also. God loves a cheerful giver. There is no better thing to give than Jesus. Because that gift will keep on giving. A life with Christ will keep on giving. A life with Jesus will keep on giving. Because if we lose our life to Christ, we will be taken care of. We already saw that. So if you're here tonight, and you're thinking about this young boy and this giving, this giving attitude, this cheerful attitude to give away his candy... He probably, didn't, he probably doesn't actually receive any type of money at this point. He may, but the story doesn't depict that. But he does have candy. And most children, if, you, if you've met them, they really enjoy candy. I know I do. But he, gives, he st stores up his candy in his pockets. He, st he keeps his candy to give to the minister. He ha and he has a cheerful heart about it. So just like that young boy, what are we doing with our Smarties? What are we doing with our pack of Smarties? Our Smarties are our time, our Smarties are our money for sure, and our Smarties are definitely our Jesus. What are you doing with yours? Sometimes we, we get busy with life, and we forget about stuff. We forget about what's important. Absolutely forget about what's important. We get bogged down with how we're going to you know, pay the bills or how we're going to save up money for a down payment for a house or how we're going to do this or how we're going to do that. Number one root of, di of divorce, money. Because we're trying to up our status always. If our focus is on Christ, if our focus is on being a cheerful giver, that'll never be. We won't have those problems. It won't matter what our status is. It won't matter about any of that. So if you're here tonight and you already were a Christian, are you giving of your time? And if you're not, why not? And if you're not, there's, there's plenty of things to do with our time. Plenty. Are you giving of your money? Are you being cheerful with it? Are you understanding that it's Christ and not yours? It's not our gain. It doesn't matter how much our salary says. It's not our gain. It, it's all to the glory of Christ. Are you giving your Jesus? Are you sharing Christ with others? If you're here tonight and you've been studying, and you understand what it means to become a child of God, understand what it means that now you have to be a cheerful giver, that you can pray to the Almighty God and He'll listen. 
and you want to make that right. You want to be in that relationship with God. You want to become a child of his. And you've been studying, and you understand what it means to be a Christian. You would like to be baptized tonight. We would love to do that. But if you're here tonight, and you, your smarties are all in your pocket, and not in somebody else's, or not in somebody else's mouth, you can change that. You can repent of that and change your ways and become a new person. You can walk out of here tonight and no longer feel like you're keeping everything that's yours, but you're giving it away. You're being a cheerful giver because it's all Christ. If you need anything tonight, if you need prayers or you want to become a child of God, please come forward as we stand and as we sing. Because he gave